when will this war end? You know, that's been a question uh, we have been asking each other. Um, think about this. First, the West came up with sanctions. They thought if we put lots and lots of sanctions and in, increase the intensity of the sanctions, as uh, President Joe Biden put it, what did he say? Then Russia will be compelled to withdraw. You know, to put Russia apparently in a like a pressure cooker box so that you know they can't handle the pressure of the sanctions and they will give up. That didn't seem to be working. Uh, so President Joe Biden said that you know it's what we're gonna do is just we're gonna keep increasing the sanctions. It's more than a month, more than two months, and it's still going on and on. Then uh, the you know West said, okay, we are going to supply Ukraine with all the missiles <clears throat> that we think they need. And they, uh, from the West, we are spent sending thousands and millions of dollars of weapons to Ukraine, hoping that they would fight and that they would be able to put an end to this war. But that doesn't seem to be working either. Even presently, right now, the war is still going on. So what are we missing really? The best mind in the world seem, doesn't seem to have the answer. Let me tell you, there is an answer. And the answer is not from me. The answer is not from people in the world. The answer is found in the wisdom of God. So before we look at that, let's figure out what is war, okay? So war, let me see if I can go to the next page. War is a state of conflict between two people groups um, with sometimes use lethal weapons. In olden days, they would use uh, you know, uh, different types of lethal weapons. Now the weapons have increased the intensity of the lethality um, and you know, basically trying to coerce one, the opposite party to do their will or to uh, grant their will. Let me take you a real quick uh, word study into that word war. It comes from the German word. If you think about, uh, I did my um, bachelor's in English literature, a lot of the words came from German, as you know. Uh, in the old high German, the word, the word was Veran. And uh, that's how the uh, word war came from. And it means to be in a state of confusion. Listen to me carefully, because you're going to see how in the history this has played out and how amazingly accurate. Today, Carrie was supposed to present on the uh, top 10 proofs of that the Bible is true. I'm not going to present that topic, but you're going to see from my presentation that how, you know, the history proves that the word of God is true. The war means a state of confusion, as I said. Um, it's often, uh, in a, in a, it's an open state declared between the two parties or two political groups, uh, you know, or sovereign states right now, like for example, uh, Russia and Ukraine, sovereign states, um, or rival political parties. We know that it, internal wars, when uh, think about the uh, wars uh, that happened internally in different countries, be it in India, be it in uh, US, be it in Russia, France, the internal wars, the rival parties, or the social factions. Um, military writers, hear me out very well, because this is important for us to understand what's going on in the war. Military writers often confine themselves to hostile, uh, to the term hostiles, in which the contending groups are sufficiently equal in power to render the outcome uh, so uncertain for a time. For military writers, and I, why I want you to hear is because when you think about Putin, he is a military, uh, let's say, um, he, he, he's a military think tank. So you have to see the war from his perspective to understand what he says. Because you don't hear, if you use your brains and my brain to hear him, you won't understand what he's talking about. So it's important to understand the war terms here, okay? 
uh, armed conflicts of powerful states with isolated and uh, you know to, to the isolated or powerless states is usually called pacification or military expedition why did putin call this a special military expedition now you know because in russia's eyes in putin's eyes ukraine is not an equal power and it's true ukraine is a lower power a, a less powerful state um, look at this sentence one more time. Armed conflicts um, of the a power uh, between a powerful state and an isolated or powerless people. So in Russia's eyes, Ukraine is powerless. The world has been trying to send weapons to empower Ukraine so that they are rising up in power so that it can be a war. Without which it would be called as put in put it, a military expedition. Okay, let's move on. With small states, they are called interventions or reprisals. So imagine if th there is a war happening inside Russia right now, they would call it as a special military intervention or a special military reprisal. Uh, and the internal groups would be called rebellions. Remember, in Iraq or other places, they were called the rebe rebel groups um, or the insurrection parties. Okay, such incidents, uh, if the resistance is sufficiently strong or protracted, right now Ukraine is getting sufficiently strong or protracting, may achieve a magnitude that entitles them to the name of war. It is a war because the West empowered Ukraine to protract against Russia. There's a difference between fighting and war. Um, war so fighting is an occasion where the fighting is, uh, is like, you know, it's like a conflict. It's a small scale conflict. But when it's large scale, when it's organized, it's between countries or states or ethnic groups, when it's sizable groups, then it's called a war or a military engagement. OK, so let's look at quickly the a glimpse of uh, what's a war look, uh, what, what, what were the earliest uh, you know, stories or a record of war. Uh, this is from the uh, Encyclopedia of History, and it says that throughout history, individuals, states, or political factions have gained sovereignty over states. We know that our history, think about our history lessons back when we were in school, okay? So how many wars did we read? It was war upon war, no matter which continent we read, no matter which country, no matter which part of the globe. We read about war upon war upon war upon war. Uh, the history of the earliest civilization, Mesopotamian uh, Empire. The Mesopot Mesopotamian Empire, uh, I'm sorry for my pronunciation on that word. I'm totally uh, killing that word. Um, it it's, uh, talks about Sargon, the, uh, you know, it, it talks about the chronicles of the constant strife, which spoke about the strifes that happened locally. Then, um, even after Sargon the Great of the Akkadian Empire, that's the part of, uh, you know, uh, that same area there, uh, unified the region under Akkadian Empire, war was still waged in putting down rebellion. So remember that word rebellion. So the smaller sects inside would be called rebellions or fending of invaders. So now outside forces are coming in. So to fend them, that was a war. The early dynastic period of Egypt is thought to have risen uh, from the war when Pharaoh Manus or Menes um, of the uh, south conquered the region of the north Egypt, uh, though this claim is disputed. There, but we know that in Egypt there has been constant war. So Mesopotamia, Egypt, let's come to east, China. In China, uh, the Zhao dynasty gained the uh, you know the ascendancy of through the battle in 1046. In China, if you look at Chinese history, I, I, a couple of months ago I was looking through the Chinese history. My goodness, Lord, it is 
like war upon war, each emperor waging the war on the next uh, trying to gain power. So it's been a bloody, bloody history in China. Uh, the Zhao dynasty gained ascendancy in 1046 BC and the conflict uh, of uh, warring states period between 476 and 221 uh, BCE um, that resolved the state of Qin uh, or Chen, at the, I believe they say Chen, um, defeated the uh, contending state in, in the battle and unified China under the rule of Emperor Shi Huangdi. If I'm saying that right, I'm not sure if, if I say that name right. Um, this pattern holds to other nations throughout time, whether one site uh, of success in, for example, in Africa, <clears throat> or whether it be it Greece, we know about uh, the Greek, like think about the Babylonian empire and then the Medo-Persian emperor empire, and then comes the Greek, then the Romans, and the history of war is the history of humanity. Unfortunately, this is the truth. Um, this is from such an old time. They think about uh, 10,000, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is like from the Mesopotamian time uh, in you know, 2000 BCE or 3000 BCE. It's like from such a long time. And all we have is just stories of war. Let's look a deeper look at the Soviet philosophy, okay? Because in order for us to understand what's going on on the here and now, right now, we need to understand how a person like Putin, who has been trained and studied Soviet philosophy of war, what he thinks, okay? Soviet theoreticians distinguish three major types of war, okay? First, between the capitalistic states, they think that that has to happen, you know, uh, between capitalist and socialist states uh, and the colonial wa warfares of liber liberation. And the uh, inter uh, wars among the capitalist states were supposed to rise from capitalist competition and the imperialist rivalries, such as those who led the two world wars. So these are desirable, according to them, uh, as they weakens the capitalistic camp. So the, the fight between the West, the fight between the capitalistic countries is a desirable thing and it has to happen because they are in the right, uh, they are rivals. Uh, unfortunately, this has, history has not proved this uh, true except for the uh, two uh, major world wars uh, and has not weakened by any chance the capitalistic societies as much as the Soviet uh, philosophers wanted it to believe. Um, a war between capitalistic and socialistic states uh, was one that clearly expressed the basic principles of class struggle. So the class struggle uh, in this is what that causes a war. Uh, therefore, one of which the socialist states must prepare. So they have to be prepared for the uh, class struggles according to the socialist. And that's the second type of war. And finally, wars of colonial liberation. Remember what Putin said. In Ukraine, there are people uh, who are from Russia who is being almost like colonized, who are mistreated and they need to be liberated. And he declared that some of the states as uh, republics or liberated. And that's a part of the war that he said he is rage, raging right now. So colonial liberation could be expected between the subjugated people and their colonial master, okay? So let's talk about the different types of war in the, according to the military ex experts. Um, philosophical, political, economic, technological. We know, uh, think about the uh, political war that's going on between the uh, Zelensky and Putin, uh, economic war that is raging, raging between the uh, Russia and the West especially, technological war that's happening between Russia trying to get, gain control over Ukrainian websites, uh, the uh, Russian, um, the cyber uh, like geeks trying to do that. Uh, Ukraine trying to do that back to Russia and a West trying to do that, all the technological war, legal war that's happening right now in UN. So think about the number of types of war that's happening right now. 
assess for yourself. Um, in India, we in just beside my home, uh, in think, 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 uh, I, I'm from Kolkata. Uh, I remember in Park Circus, there was often clashes between Hindu and Muslim. You know about the clashes between uh, Hindu and Muslim when the India was divided between um, Pakistan and Bangladesh, and uh, how you know Hindus were killing Muslims, and uh, you know uh, Hindus were killing. Sikhs and you know it was just a mess. Uh, you know Muslims were killing Sikhs. It was just a hot mess. Um, you know the religious wars, and still right now the one of the biggest uh, struggles in India is the religious war. Uh, sociological, uh, you know the between the different uh, types of uh, you know people, the races, psychological war, and that happens. It's a real thing, and you know uh, Russia tries to do that right now, like trying to put the rest of the world into like a, uh, you know, saying that, oh, this is how you are. And the, the West tries to put that back or Ukraine is trying to put that back on Russia, Russian armies. Think, think as you look, look at and listen to the news, okay? And um, I'm gonna tell the last one, but this is not mentioned by the military experts, but this is mentioned according to the wisdom of God, spiritual warfare. And we're gonna come back in a second to that. So question to you, why is there so much of warfare in our history? Think about our history. It's, you know, how Jesus said, in our history is that of uh, one marked with blood. It's too much bloodshed. Um, Old Testament records a lot of wars. You know, sometimes people will say, look at your God. He's asking you to wage wars. But unfortunately, think about this. It's not our God just asking you to wage wars. It's the humanity itself who is waging war upon itself. Uh, you know, human beings have turned into animals trying to wage war among themselves. And Old Testament is where God, you know, reaches out to people in their background. God does not take them out of the context, in the context, trying to bless those who are trying to follow him and redeem the, uh, the, good, uh, the good out of the evil situation and trying to take the evil and redeem the situation for the good. Our God does not operate in vacuum. As much as you like to think that, you know, oh, slavery, war, this, that, it is because our God does not operate in vacuum. He does not take you out of your context and put you in another context and try to help you. No. He knows the situation you and I are in. He knows we are in a war situation and he still helps us. Does he like it? No, he doesn't. But he, he cannot, he will not take us out and he's not gonna, oh, I love you. Let me take you to heaven. It's perfectly peaceful. No, for us to grow, uh, for us to ma mature, he has to take us through life. And where we learn to depend on him and every time when people depended on God, there was peace. When people turned against who God, when people chose to disobey God, there was war. When God executed judgment on people, there was war. War is what man chose. Um, human history is marked with bloodshed and desire to control. There is too much of evil. There's too much of evil. Hear me out. Um, not every war, is evil, but the backdrop, what causes it, and the consequence is always evil. And sometimes the war itself is evil. So in Old Testament, God comes as a judge who uses circumstances to judge people according to their deeds and redeems the evil choices people make and turns them to, for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So let's talk about war in the Bible. People in the Bible, biblical times were the people of God, I told you. They, they, when you believe in God, your life is not a bed of roses. Don't expect it to be. That's not what God promises. Um, think about Palestine. Think about Israel. In 
two, in 150 years, there were 200 wars. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that for a second that in 150 years, there were 200 wars? Think about you being in that situation. They know what it means to be in a situation of war. When the Lord Jesus lived on earth, right? It, you know, it was under the Roman Empire. He was under the Roman Empire. It was because of war. Um, Jews have experienced the worst of the wars in the history. Since the time even Israel came back to existence in 1947, it has been fighting for its existence. Uh, you know, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed two times over. The, think about the church. You know, in the church, you know, that in the early church was, there was, there was no, it was not an organized religion. Jesus never called the church to be an organized religion. The church that exists as an organized religion is a false church. But the church that uh, is a believer of Jesus Christ, the Lord, scattered across, they were always persecuted. And the physical war is much easier to fight. What's the most difficult to fight, and you and I are called to fight in the New Testament times, is the invisible fight, the spiritual war. I'll give you one example in this day and age that just makes a point. COVID. Can you see the virus? No. That's why it's so hard to fight. When you cannot see, you don't know where to fight, what to do, and how to get over it. We don't know. Even now, the world is struggling to fight COVID because it's an invisible enemy. It's invisible to naked eyes. Spiritual warfare is something similar because it's invisible to majority of the world. And that is why, this is where I want you to hear this out. What is the true reason of war? Unless we hit the true reason of this war, the war will not end. The war will not end. The true reason for the war. Listen with me and read with me Daniel chapter 10. This is on the Old Testament. It's one of the prophetic books. It's a prophetic book that, you know, the prophecies have still not finished yet, even right now. And also listen with me and read with me Daniel chapter 10 and verse 12 onwards. Daniel chapter 10, and let me take a look at the time. I don't want to uh, go beyond the time. So we have a little bit of time left. Um, verse 12. So this is uh, Daniel writing about his experience. Then he continued. And this is an angel speaking to Daniel, okay? Daniel had been fasting and praying, trying to figure out what on the earth is going on. And he has been so weak in the previous verses. Remember, to understand a portion, you need to see the context. So the context is where Daniel had been fasting and praying. He has been weak because of, you know, spiritual warfare that's going on. And he, this is the um, explanation of that. Do not be afraid, Daniel, says the angel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding, Listen to what Daniel has been doing. He has been set his mind to gain understanding. Is that what you and I have been trying to do? To understand? To gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God. Are we humble or are we proud? Are we saying, look at me. I am doing so much. I'm going to church. I'm going to temple. I'm going to mosque. I'm doing giving money. I'm going this, that, this, that. Are we humble or are we proud? Your words were heard and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. So what's going on in the background? There is a warfare going up in the, in the area, the spiritual realm. Our eyes can see, our physical eyes can see the physical realm. 
the reason people ignore, people don't understand, people deny the existence of God and the angels, be it the good or the fallen ones, is because they're, they are not perceptive. They do not know how to understand the spiritual realm. Let me ask you today, how is your spiritual eyes? How is your understanding? Are you able to understand what's going on in the spiritual realm? So listen, listen to me here right now. Um, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. But then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there by the king of Persia. There is a king of Russia, and not talking about Putin here. I'm talking about the invisible realms that you and I cannot see. There's an invisible realm. There is a evil power. There's an evil satanic power that is in charge of each empire, each kingdom. There is an evil power that works in India. There's an evil power that works in America. There's an evil power that works in Russia. And the prince of Russia, why do I say about the prince of Russia? Remember, what did the Lord Jesus say in John chapter 10? The enemy comes to still kill and destroy. What is happening in the war? Still kill and destroy. That's how we know this is a power of the evil one. And there is a evil uh, satanic power that's working in Russia. And until you and I are able to pray against that one, until you and I fast and pray that the Lord would send his angels to defeat, to stop that power of the prince of Russia, this war will not end. Trust me on that. Look here what happened. Verse 14. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen in, to you and your people in future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. So now the angel is about to explain to Daniel what the vision that he had. And he was trying to pray and figure out what is going on. He did not understand what was going on, what he was seeing. So you and I are in the similar situation. Until we humble ourselves, until we try to understand and until we pray <clears throat> that God would work why would why do we need to do that look at verse 18 again the one who looked like the uh, looked like a man touched me the angel touched me and gave me strength do not be afraid you are highly esteemed said he said peace be strong now be strong in the time of the war the lord wants us to be strong but our heart naturally is weak. We are anxious people. I am anxious. You are anxious. And he says what? When he spoke to me, I was strengthened. The word of God from the Bible will strengthen you. The word of God strengthens. Are you and I reading the word of God? Um, he said, do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. Remember, there is, I told you, there, are, there is satanic powers over every kingdom. But first, I tell you what is written in the book, book of truth. The book of truth is what you need to know. Daniel needed to know this. You need to know this. If you don't know what is in the book of truth, and if, you're, if you don't understand the book of truth, then it is a, it's, it's, the life is a disaster. L life is, has no meaning if you do not understand the book of truth. The word of God, the Bible is a book of truth. And you and I need to read it, need to understand it. And the angel said, no one supports me except Michael, your prince. The good angels are need, need to support 
and they need to fight against the evil powers that are in charge of each kingdom. So let's move on and let's see uh, the, you know, how this concept of evil power is there in every culture, okay? Let's talk about the different religions. Hinduism, you know, we grew up learning about, you know, when I came from a Hindu ba Brahmin background, I knew growing up that there was a, what in Bengali we say shaitan or Hindi we say shaitan, right? So, you know, there, there are, you know, lots of evil spirits that is, you know, commonly known to Hindus. Buddhism, we know about Mara. Then there is uh, the daughters of Mara, Rati, Raga, and Tanha. You know, they are the evil spirits in Buddhism. In Zoroastrianism, Azel, Azazel is there. Leviathan, Rahab, Lilith. These are all demons in Zoroastrianism. In Islam, Harut and Marut. These are the two Islamic uh, mythical angels. In Judaism, it talks about Shem Hazai, Uza, Azael. In Japanese, we have Oni. So you think about East to West, the concept of evil power, the, in, the fallen angels, the uh, evil spirits, it's a common known fact. But what does the Bible talk about it? And let's look at that for a second, okay? This is in Ephesians chapter six. If you have a Bible, please turn it with me. And we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6. Why is this important? I will tell you why. And we have five minutes to, uh, to or less than 10 minutes to wrap this up. Finally, be strong in the Lord, in the mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take a stand against de devil's schemes. So we are called to take a stand against devil's schemes. Satan has a scheme. And part of that is to destroy you. Part of that is to destroy our people. Part of that is to just take our people, take our nation away from God. So in order for you to understand and see that and fight against that, you and I need to put the full armor of God. For our struggle is not Think about the whole world was praying against Putin and against the war. How many of us actually prayed against the power of Satan right there that was fighting and controlling the mind of Putin? Controlling the mind of every person in that war who was scheming evil, be it in Russia, Ukraine, US, no matter where it is. Are we praying against and taking our stand against them? Or is our hatred so earthly and so worldly that we only see the person and not the power controlling that? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is not talking about heaven, but in uh, heavenly realms is the place around the earth, a realm that you and I cannot see with our earthly eyes. We don't have a spiritual eye. That's why we cannot see it. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. So make sure you do everything in your power to stand. Because what does Satan want? We, he wants us to fall. He made Adam and Eve to disobey God and cause the fall. He caused you and I to disobey God and caused our fall. You and I have chosen to disobey God and disregard God too many times in our lives. We are in a war zone, except our enemy cannot be seen. If you are in Ukraine listening to me or in Russia, you are having a real war, a physical war, especially in Ukraine. 
But even if you're not, no matter where in the earth you are, you are in a spiritual war, you know it or not. And this is where I want to talk to you today. Look at this here. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that you are, when the day of evil comes, there are days of evil in your life. If you fall because you have not put on the full armor, are, are you having the full armor? See what the full armor is all about, okay? Only if you put on the full armor, you can stand. Otherwise, you will fall when the temptation comes, when the day of evil comes, when calamity hits. With a belt of truth buckled around the waist. Are we truthful? Do, is truth what we hold on to or are we too much into lying? There is not one of you and not even me that I can say that I don't lie. Not one. We all tell lies. Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of you listening to me right now have told lies. But scripture says the, in the whole armor of God, we need to stand uh, putting the breast, uh, taking the uh, buckle of truth around the uh, waist. A belt holds the pants together or skirt together, whatever together so that our shame is not shown. If truth is not in your portion, your, your shame, your sin will be seen by everybody. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. If he is not your, the one who is covering your sin and shame, you will be ashamed. Look here with me, the following part. And the breastplate of righteousness. My dear friends, you think you're righteous? I thought I was righteous when I was trying to worship all the idols and giving the fruits and the flowers and money and doing all kinds of fasting. I thought I was righteous. When I compare myself to other people, I might think I am righteous. But when I compare myself to the standard of God, the perfect standard of God, I have fallen so short. I cannot, I cannot meet that holy standard. God's standard is here and I am here. So this is my question to you. Where, is, where, where do you think you stand? The breastplate of righteousness cannot come from you. It can come from the Lord Jesus. If you read the last verse of Romans chapter four, it says he died. The Lord Jesus died for your sins and my sins. And he was raised for our justification. We are justified. We are made righteous through the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. But are you engaging in sin today? If that, in that case, the breastplate of righteousness you do not have in place. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you engage in sin, you're not putting on the full armor of God. So don't complain that God, why did not you rescue me? Why did you not help me? Excuse me. Did God tell you to sin? No. So don't put it on God, please. Next. Uh, with your feet Fitted with the readiness to, uh, that comes from the gospel of peace. Let me ask you this. Are you ready to talk about the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, to everybody? Or are you always so busy, so shy, so whatever excuse you have to not share the gospel? My question is, are you ready? Are you preparing yourself to be ready? If not, if you don't know. The gospel is the gospel of peace. What does gospel mean? Gospel is the good news. What's the gospel? If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3 onwards, the scripture says that the Lord Jesus took your place and died uh, for us. 
He was buried for us and he was raised on the third day for us, according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. The gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is not the books in the, uh, in the New Testament. The gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready to accept him today? Are you ready to share him today with your loved ones, with your friends and families? Are you ready? And it comes to verse 16. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith. Have you put your faith on the Lord Jesus? What does it mean to have faith? Faith means you're putting your entire trust, not on religion, that is you're going to church, going to temple, doing good things, trying to please God, because doing good things will never please God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It is not a result of good works, lest any should boast. Are you trying to please God through your good works? Guess what? It's not going to work. So if you need to uh, you know, have the full armor of God, if you want to please God, put your faith on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he do? He's son of God who took on humanity because he knew you and I were under the power of the evil. You and I were stuck, but you and I, you and I, what was desperate and was pleading for freedom but couldn't do it by ourselves so the lord jesus shed his blood and paid the price for your and my sins the lord jesus who is god 100 percent god and 100 percent man <clears throat> there was he that's why his the the blood when he shed was so extraordinarily <clears throat> expensive and it was able to cover and pay the price for the whole world, everyone who believes. The question is, have you believed? If you have not, today, in order to fight against the power of the evil, you need to have the breastplate, uh, the shield of uh, the faith. Look here, verse 16, the shield of faith, which will extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. If you want the, fla uh, the, the, the attack of the devil on you, that it should not reach you and there would be a cover and a shield right here, you need to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. When you put your faith on the a person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he took your place and died for you. He shed his blood to redeem you. He rose again from death to destroy the power of Satan. Then what happens? You get salvation. Salvation from the power of evil. Salvation from the consequence of sin. Salvation from the eternal judgment. And you have the sword of the spirit because the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. The spirit of God can never come and live in you until you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Until you accept the Lord Jesus Christ because sin and God cannot coexist. If you need the Holy Spirit to help you, the scripture says, you know, when you believe the one who is within you is greater than the one who is outside. The power of evil cannot, cannot put you down if you believe in the Lord Jesus and put up the, uh, the whole armor of God. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. The Bible is able, the word of God will protect you. It'll help to Remember when the Lord Jesus was in that wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and the power of Satan, the Satan came and to tempt him. And every time he tried to tempt the Lord Jesus took the word of God and defended it. Are you using the word of God? Do you, do you read the Bible? If not, start today. Uh, you know, when you fight, when you use sword, it's a skill. So you need to learn how to use the sword. And in all occasions, pray. So when you, my dear friends, you know, if you, praying is communication with the Lord. Praying is when you talk to God. 
So if you want to talk to God today, and if you have not put on the whole armor of God today, today is your day. Today is the day of salvation. Come to the Lord Jesus. Come. And the power of Satan cannot. The Lord rescued me from the bondage of Satan. He can rescue you. Fighting the invisible fight is much more difficult. So if you have not understood that yet, today is the day to start. So with that, um, you know, we, I, I hand it over back to uh, Saju and uh, after that, Rufus. Uh, thank you, Sadabdi, for that uh, powerful uh, presentation. Now, um, this is the time for uh, questions and answers. Um, I've received some questions and um, Sadabdi is going to answer that. And if any of you have further questions, uh, I would highly recommend you to send that in to me uh, very quickly. Uh, first question, Sadabdi. Why should we even have to pray for the stoppage of wars? Why not God just stop it without needing our prayers? God wants us to communicate with him. Uh, you know, when we pray, <clears throat> we show we are depending on God. And God likes, it's like, you know, I'm going to give my child food. You know, and in the time I, I know that's right. I know I'm going to give the child food, but I like it when my child comes and talks to me and say, mommy, I'm hungry. Mommy, I want this. Mommy, I want that. You know, God delights for us to, you know, when we depend on him, when we talk to him and we communicate with him, God is a God of communication. And that's why he wants us to pray against the, uh, you know, for us to stop, for us to be able to, be a part of him ending the power of evil. Don't you want to be on, on the uh, side of God doing that? Okay, great. Um, in other words, you are saying it's not that God is not capable of stopping the war by himself, but then he wants us to be part of that stopping the war Correct. process. Correct. Okay, great. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, anybody, uh, Rufus, you want to add anything to this? Nothing much, nothing much. Nothing okay, much. sure. Uh, moving on to the next question. How differently one needs to fight the spiritual warfare than the spiritual war, physical war? Physical war, th there are certain principles that might be similar, but we dealt through Ephesians 6 that gives the principle as to how we need to do the spiritual warfare. Uh, you know, if we are lacking in one of these, the chances are we'll get wounded. Just like in a physical warfare, if we don't have the right strategies and right things, if we are not able to see the schemes of the next uh, the enemy, we will lose it. So, uh, you know, th there are some similarities, but it's a complete two different realms. So it needs two different types of uh, intervention. And, and the um, spiritual one is much more difficult than the physical one. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. I'm moving on to the next question. Uh, is this, since God's righteousness is so far beyond us and we can never imagine to reach it and all our attempts at reaching that standard will just be futile, why should we even bother with righteousness? And that we cannot ever, no matter what we try to do, ever reach that. I'm, I'm agreeing that with you. But that is where the Lord Jesus Christ steps in. He accomplished, you know, he fulfilled all the righteous de de uh, the requirements of the law. And he says, you know, I'm willing to take your sins and, and I'm giving my righteousness to you. So your account of righteousness is full, not because of what you have done, but because of what you, Lord Jesus has done for you. And he's willing to credit it to you the moment you put your faith on him. Okay. Okay, great. Um, uh, Rufus, you want to add on to that? I think that's that's good enough here. Yeah. It's good enough. Okay. Okay. Good. Um. I think uh, anyone else has any questions? So please. Uh, I have just maybe one or two short questions. 
uh, be prepared to ask maybe if anybody has a question want to ask it right now publicly can be asked um so uh, Shadad, what do you say what is the ultimate cause of sin or cause of war what what is the primary cause of war uh, we discussed about how the one of the main causes of war is human heart is desperately evil you know there is greed the, the, you know everybody wants to control they have territorial like okay this is my territory no that's like this is all about human depravity our heart is the desperately evil says jeremiah it says god through jeremiah prophet jeremiah so and that's the result because of which war started you know in the in in the angelic realm first and then has been continuing when man chose to follow satan and the garden of eden he you know the war came to earthly level and that has been continuing till now until the lord jesus comes back and for a thousand year he sets up his earthly kingdom here and when there will be perfect peace and and there will be a last war between satan and uh, his followers and the lord jesus and his followers in the in the in the battle of armageddon um and you know uh, gag and magog and then uh there will be the final judgment and satan will be cast into the lake of fire and that's it that's it and you know, that will be the end of war okay so in other words you are saying that the ultimate cause of any war is is evil or the sin mm -hmm. part of our life yes is that right yes okay great and uh, one question that has come in now it's it's uh, i think it's a form of a statement uh, for an unbeliever the bible seeks to be overwhelming putting too much pressure on man like praying for end of wars etc um for an unbeliever you know, they don't understand the things of God. So it will be overwhelming. <clears throat> you have to accept the Lord Jesus. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, then it becomes so easy to understand because the Lord Jesus becomes your teacher. When you don't have a good teacher that you feel overwhelmed, no matter what subject you read. So uh, when you believe in the Lord Jesus and he's your teacher, eventually it doesn't happen in a day. Like I have the best teacher maybe for Eva and Chris, my kids. But still, they, I, if I give them a book of calculus, they cannot understand anything of calculus right now. With time, they will, though, because they will have a good teacher. Same way, you know, for an unbeliever, they don't understand because they don't have a good teacher. Once you believe in the Lord Jesus, he starts teaching you, and with time, you will understand. So don't get overwhelmed. So hang on. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, the last question that I have uh, is uh, the topic itself. When will the war end? The war will end when Satan is cast out in the lake of fire. That's, that's going to be the end. And the new heavens and new earth going to come down from heaven. And you know, there will be peace on earth. Before the, uh, that final part, there will be a thousand years when the Lord Jesus will literally reign. And there will be time of peace. But in between, uh, around that, until Satan is judged, until the power of evil is judged, there will be war. Because Satan is the cause of war. Sin is the cause of war. And until that is not, not dealt with, the war will continue. Amen. Amen. Great. Now, if anyone, anyone has any quick question, if you can raise your hand, we can unmute you and ask this uh, question. If it's uh, relevant to this topic. Anyone has any quick question? No, no, let's do that yeah. in the informal time. Okay, sure, we will do that. Okay, uh, over to uh, Brother Rufus for a final uh, concluding thoughts and uh, closing with the word of prayer as well. Thank you, Sadabdi, so much. Yeah, um, I'll come back to the meaning of the song that I had, uh, uh, had sung at the beginning of the meeting. Now, <clears throat> when the new Jerusalem or the new heavens and the new earth comes down, all the <clears throat> sorry, all the worries and all the things that trouble us on this earth. When we remember the uh, coming eternity that that is going to happen, you know, with Jesus coming in as the King, 
all of these worries and troubles that we have of this current scenarios on earth, it will all be uh, erased. And we, uh, we will be in a land or we will be in a place or we will be in a, a setting where there is no more suffering and no more poverty. I mean, these are things along with war that we are struggling with, at least uh, a lot of people in the world today. And when uh, we uh, go into the house or into the eternal dwellings that God has, God has kept for us, we will be ruling along with the King, Jesus Christ, for eternity. And when the Son of Righteousness, Jesus Christ, when he rises and makes his second coming visible, all the darkness that we are characterized with on the earth, as, as Sister Siddhartha just said, you know, when will these wars end? When Satan is defeated and when the presence of sin is removed. All right, so uh, when sin and Satan are removed for all of eternity, there is no uh, tension or there is no worry. Um, and it's full of happiness and joy as we rule the world with Christ. There's no sorrow, there's no sickness, there's no wars or rumors of wars, and there is no rebellion that is any way going to happen against God when Jesus is going to be the king in all his glory. Now, who enters into all of these uh, blessed uh, realms or who, who becomes a, a part of all of these things which we just described? Those who walked in holiness. And who are those who walked in holiness? It's those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And they will come, join in this eternal happiness with all joy, shorts of joy. And uh, they will adorn themselves. They are adorned with joy and happiness as though a king is adorned with his crown. And as time ends and as eternity moves on, this is what a uh, true, uh, true believer of Christ will enjoy for all of eternity. Escaped from all of the effects of sin in this world. So with this song being self-explanatory, I don't need to add anything along with what Shadab just mentioned uh, till, till this point. So I'll just conclude with a word of prayer, praying for uh, all those who are uh, listening to this conversation right now. Shall we all pray? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for these wonderful words that remind us of the glorious truth that when your son Jesus Christ arrives uh, back as king, he will remove all the things that we are troubled with. We are troubled with the presence of sin in this world. We are troubled with all the effects of sin in this world. And war is just one of those things which we are talking about. There are many other things which we experience on a daily basis, but uh, we thank you for the gospel that hasn't just offered us eternal forgiveness. It has also offered us, or it has also told us about the restoration that you will uh, make it happen when uh, your son comes as comes back as king, reclaiming his rightful authority over the world that uh, Satan tried to assert from. Lord. Thank you for the truth that it's on the cross. Satan and sin and death were defeated by your son. And that is the proof that all what we have discussed is true. And uh, we pray for all those who are listening to this on various platforms. We pray that you may work in their hearts, help them to understand that there is only one true solution to all the problems that we face. And that's belief in Jesus Christ. And I pray that <clears throat> uh, people's hearts might be opened and that they might believe and be saved from all of their eternal damnation. Lord. We commit all of us in your care. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.